here. Amen. Uh, we, we appreciate them and they're, they're going to introduce themselves. Uh, it's my understanding, and I spoke to him personally, the uh, uh, incumbent alderman, uh, Greg Mitchell, will not be participating in today's forum. He uh, said he had a conflicting schedule event and which enabled him to be here this morning. He encouraged you to look at his website uh, for his vision for the ward, and so I would ask for you to do that. And so we want to hear more about what his platform is. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to those that are in charge, because I'm gonna make a dash out. But before we do that, let's take a moment to pray. Yes. Father God, we thank you this morning for allowing us to come together. We thank you for allowing us to behold a brand new day, a day we've never seen before, and a day we shall never witness again. But we are mindful that this is the day that you have made. And scripture tells us to rejoice and be glad in it. And we pray uh, blessings uh, upon these candidates that are seeking this office of alderman. We pray, Father God, that you would endow them with the uh, spirit uh, of power and leadership, dear Father God, so that they'll be able to do uh, what you call them to do. We pray for every person under the sound of my voice, those that are on their way. We pray for this seventh ward community. We pray blessings upon it. And then we pray for this forum, Father God, that it will be fruitful and informative and help us make the right decision as we cast votes uh, for this great office of Alderman. We just love you today, and we appreciate all you have done for us. We thank you for forgiving us for our sins and our transgressions. We thank you, Father God, for how you continue to keep us. And we pray, dear Lord, that we'll give you all of the glory in all that we do. This is our prayer in the matchless, uh, magnificent, mighty name of Jesus. I do pray. Amen, amen. Come on, let's amen. appreciate those that have been leading us further. that model because one of the things that happened when they had that model 
Nothing moved in South Shore without going through the people. So it is a bottom-up effect, but it's a government effect as well because you become the governors of your community. If you look on your table, you'll see something that says South Shore Area Council Boundaries. If you look at that, that will tell you what area you live in. And right now we're organizing in four of them as we are speaking, different areas are reactivating. The areas that are currently reactivating is Burmar East, O'Keefe, South Shore Neighbors South, and I'm missing one. I can't remember. Central South Shore. Central South Shore, thank you. <laughs> Central South Shore, and they're all in different stages. Some have their their, commit, their uh, steering committees, some ha have already established their bylaws, some are waiting to hold their elections. So as we're going through this thing, please be aware of when, you, when we come to your part of the neighborhood, you already know you can help mobilize your area. And with that, I would like to say, first of all, <laughs> oh, will I have one minute? Okay, so I would like to just kind of wrap this up. We're having the seventh war forum. We did invite our elected, all the, all the candidates. And so at this time, we only have, like, not only, but we have two that showed up. And we would like to uh, give them the respect that's due for coming out to talk to you about what their vision is. As I turn this over to the moderator, her name is Kiana Barrett. Kiana? Oh, it's, no, no, no. I'm sorry, Ann. Dems on the run, on the move. <laughs> so we're partnering with Dems on the move. And I would like to bring up Ann Johnson because Robin Kelly, who's our Congresswoman, is starting a new organization where she wants to get more involved in what's happening on a local level, and especially here in South Shore. And Ann is here to talk more about Dems on the move and why it's important that we vote. If you don't mind turning it over, I'm turning it over to her. Can give her a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, good morning. Good morning. I can't hear me in the background, so did the mic turn off when I took it? No, I, I didn't. Okay, great. I am Ann Geringer, and I am the chairperson, director for Dems on the Move. Uh, I'm kind of Robin Kelly's little sister-ish. She's known me for all coming up. And when certain things happened, I'm done looking, but when certain things happened, she said, hey, you know all that work that you did way, way north, because I used to be in Lake County, we need you to now come and do that for the second congressional district. And what Dems on the Move is, the vision that we have is some, it's kind of like the cement that helps with all of the blocks, and I realize that that is a wall kind of visual, but there do need to be walls built, but it's walls of inclusiveness and not walls of exclusion. So we are the mortar that holds the bricks together, or we want to be the mortar that holds the bricks together between the block club, clubs, between the democratic organizations and progressive organizations, because it's really important that we have a support not only in your community, but in your co larger community. The second congressional district is very diverse. I actually live on a ranch way out in Crete. So I grew up in the city, I grew up in Hyde Park. So I do understand all of the different things. I have family that lives in the suburbs, but we're so blue in the city that sometimes we don't understand that it's really important for us to be blue out in Kankakee. So once we get all of our ducks in a row in the city, sometimes it's helpful if we can go and help to quack and kink a key. But if you don't have someone that's bridging everyone together, then you really don't have any communication between all of those organizations. So that's kind of what Dems on the Move does. We do exactly what Val described as far as looking for millennials, looking for new talent, looking for new engagement, not only to run for offices, but also just to be engaged in the community. We want well-educated with real information, real facts, because they do exist. Facts are still a thing. Can we all just have one round of applause for facts? Yes. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> yes. 
so we really want to make sure that our constituency, that our voting block is educated. You will vote the way that you see fit to vote, but we want everyone to have the appropriate and the correct and the factual information to vote. And then we are hoping that some people become so engaged that they go on to want to run for something, library boards, school boards, aldermen of your communities. So that is exactly what we're doing and why we partner so well with all of the different organizations for the city. I was asked, I'm switching hats really quickly because <laughs> I want to give them as much time, I didn't try to give them some extra time, but I was asked to speak about how important it is to vote. And I thought about it, I said, these people are coming out and it's gonna be balmy, 36 degrees after the week that we've had. On a Saturday morning at 9.30, they're leaving their homes to hear very local politicians speak about their visions for the community. I don't really think they need me to tell them how important it is to vote. You guys know that, right? Yes? No? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, has there not been enough coffee passed around? <laughs> but I am happy to see children in the audience because of course, when you got one thing down, which is knowing how important it is to vote, then you get another assignment. Can anyone guess what that next assignment is going to be in your civic duties? You got three things that you have to do, according to the Gospel of Anne, to be civically sound. We know you've got to vote, and in order to vote, you've got to register to vote. What's the third thing that you think is massively important for your civic duty as a citizen of this community, of this city, of this state, of this country. Yeah. Pardon? Bring someone with you. Know who you're voting for. Know who you're voting for. Bring someone with you. But I'm gonna drag the train along to say, register for the census. Mm. Didn't see that one coming, did you? So I always tell people, there's three things you have to do. Register, register, vote. Register for the census register to vote and vote because a lot of times we register but we don't vote we can see that by the statistics of how many registered voters actually vote here's why it's important to register for the census all of these things bridge together and i'm not sure if you've heard the rumor that illinois will be losing made one maybe two congressional districts has anyone heard that rumor yeah. that will be lose do you know why we lose those districts because of lost population. Do you know how they count lost population? The census. The census. There you go. So what they do is they take a census of the whole country. And you know when something is important? When people try to convince you not to do it. When the people who don't have your interest at heart try to convince you not to do something or try to make you fearful of doing something, you see that right now. How are they trying to win elections? And I'm saying a they. I'm being nonpartisan. So whoever they is that you think is... How, how are they trying to win elections? They're trying to take away your vote. They're trying to make it difficult for you to vote. How do they manipulate how much representation you get in the state and in Congress with your congressional people? They try to frighten you from filling out the census. They try to frighten you from registering. When they get the census numbers, there will be one total number and they'll say, okay, we have Oh, I should have had more coffee. How many Congress of people do we have? This is a, this is a quiz for the kids. Okay, if we don't know, we just say 100. So if there's 100 Congress people, I, I actually do know the number. But if, if there's 100 Congress people, they're going to divide all of the people in the United States up and have 100 congressional districts. So guess what? If they've convinced half of your neighborhood not to register for the census, or if half of your register a neighbor says, well, I don't want to be counted. I don't want the government in my business. I don't want them to know what I'm doing. Then you're only going to get half of the representation in Congress. You're only going to get half of the representation in the State House. You're only going to get for your community half or less of the funds that are allotted by population. So when you have programs for different things, you'll have less money because they think you have less people. So that is what they try to do. They try to convince you not to register in the census or give you excuses or give you all kinds of reasons. And there will be people knocking on your door. There will be things mailed to your house. There'll be concerts, there'll be parties. 
please, 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 if you do nothing else today, then listen to the crazy ranch lady beg you to register for the census in 20 and also have everyone in your family and everyone that you know to register for the census. So I know it's early in the morning and everybody hasn't had coffee and you're really here to hear the alderman, but we can have a one, two, three cheer. We're going to register, register, vote. Register, 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 register vote. vote. Register, 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 vote. register, register, vote. Register, register, vote. Register, register, vote. Thank you very, very much. I believe now I will be turning it over to Kiana. Oh, good morning. Thank you, Ann, so much. Register, register, vote. Well, good morning, South Shore. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you all so much for coming out today. What is in it for South Shore? That is the question that we are posing today and should be asking every day and in every conversation because we are community stakeholders that are vested in our community. So we are here today to hear from the candidates that will be on the ballot, um, just so that we are all clear, and I know we've got an informed body of people, early voting has already started. And so I think it's very important as we talk about the register, register vote, that we keep that in mind. Early voting has started. And so right now, early voting is downtown at the super site on 175 West Washington. It will be moving into the 50 wards. Anybody know our early voting site in the 7th Ward? Yeah. That's Jeffrey Matter Library. Jeffrey Matter. Very good. Yes, so again, if by chance you feel that you may not be able to make it out on election day, you have the ability to register to register on line and in person, but to vote. So we just want to make sure that you all are aware of that. But we've got two very distinguished gentlemen that are standing here to my left, and I know that we want to make sure that we have an opportunity to hear from them, get to know them and their platform and their vision for our community. So without further ado, I'm going to give just a very quick intro of each of them. Um, our first candidate is Jeff. Benadiah Brown, he is a long-term resident of South Shore, a strong community activist and voice for justice and change in our community. Let's give it up for Jedediah Brown. Our next candidate is Charles Kyle, equally a very vested and long-term resident of South Shore, very active in a range of community organizations passionate about equality and justice for our community and creating access for all residents. Let's give it up for Charles Kyle. So we're in a um, house of God and we're going to definitely make sure that we do this decently and in order. And so you should have received um, a handout when you walked in that has the format for today, but I'll just walk us through it very quickly just so that you understand how we're gonna facilitate the conversation. Again, we're doing this in a very just manner. God. Very good, thank you so much. Quick housekeeping note, restrooms, the ladies' room is right down the stairs here. And the uh, men's room is right up the stairs, so if you need to visit any of those areas, feel free. Uh, our format, we will have an uh, opening from each candidate, which will be two minutes. From there, we will take the same question that will be generated from a public policy issue. Each candidate will be asked the same question and afforded two minutes to respond. The following candidate will have a one-minute rebuttal to that uh, response. From there, we will open the floor up for questions from um, our audience members. Um, I believe that each of you should have received a ticket when you walked in. If by chance you didn't, please raise your hand and we'll make sure you get one. We're gonna do this in a democratic way um, and make sure that we hear from as many of you as we possibly can. But time, of course, we have to be mindful of. And please, make sure that you are posing a question because we really want to make sure that our candidates have an opportunity to speak to those issues. So if you do have um, a question, please formulate that. You might want to write it down so that when it is your turn, you'll be ready to speak to your question in a very succinct way. 
From there, we will have a one minute closing from our uh, candidates, and then we'll just have some last minute announcements from our host. So once again, we wanna make sure that we um, afford this time to our candidates to respond to the issues. We ask that you would hold your applause. I know I won't even talk about booing because I know this is a highly educated and respectful crowd, so I know that we know better than that. Um, and we want to set an example for our young people that are here with us as well. So without further ado, we're going to get started with our first question. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, and again, just another footnote. Um, an invitation was extended to um, Alderman Greg Mitchell. I believe, as Pastor Anquit said, there was a scheduling conflict, so he could not join us today. Uh, but again, there was an invitation extended to all three candidates that will appear on the ballot um, in February. Um, our first question, and this is pertaining to leadership in general. As you can see from the diverse audience of stakeholders and residents that are here today, South Shore boasts of a very robust community organizing and community group population. Can you speak to us as to how your vision and your leadership style will work in concert with existing community organizations and to create like leadership and open access? We'll start uh, with Charles and then we'll move to Jedediah and the next question will go in the opposite direction. Good morning. So I'm, I'm big on independence and transparency. I've been involved in a lot of organizations the war in South Shore in particular. And um, the way in which you make sure that the community and the autumn's office is working together is by the autumn's office empowering community organizations. Um, I, built, I was a part of the, the planning coalition. I worked with ASE, I've worked with multiple organizations in the ward. And what I noticed was that those organizations weren't necessarily empowered or given the resources they needed to be super successful in the war. So, in terms of what I would do, I would just make sure I'm giving organizations the resources that they need, access to my staff and myself, and making sure that at the end of the day, organizations know that they can come to me as an auditor, and I'll make sure that we're all working in concerts together to make sure we have everything for the ward. Thank you. Greetings, everybody. Um, I have, over the last decade, had the pleasure of identifying greatest resource of any government, and that is its residents, its constituency. And uh, just like Charles, I've partnered with so many organizations throughout the years, and there's a common issue for South uh, and West Side uh, organizations that look to do good in the city of Chicago. Uh, that is the fact that they're under-resourced and poorly represented by our government. And the partnership is, is just not there. And so just kind of, um, um, Building upon what he said, Ford Motor Company came before the Ford Foundation. Um, in order for you to be effective in dealing with philanthropic and humanitarian efforts, you have to be able to have the resources to do so. And for me, I believe in self-sustainability. Uh, and so with that, I commit as an alderman, recognizing that the most central part and responsibility of being an alderman is to identify resources and to partner with those community organizations by making sure that they can uh, reach those deliverable outcomes. And for us, I believe that there needs to be uh, a lot of training around small business ownership, and we need to be creating a new generation of entrepreneurs who then can self-fund their, uh, their projects to do community work. And the reason why that is a, an issue is because a lot of people try to get 501c3s, but the issue is, is that when you have so many people getting 501c3s and they're fighting over a very minuscule amount of resources from government grants, then you see that there's a lot of competition and there's no community, and we have to break it up by making sure that we use grants to fund collaboration. But I like what she said. There's a very diverse group of people who make up this community, and that actually is an opportunity. It creates an opportunity for us to become interested in learning about each other and our different plights of life, and I want to host regular meetings like this as an alderman that are working groups that is not just to come and talk about what's going on in the city hall, but we need to create an identity for our community, and we need to figure out who we all are, and we need to come together and craft a plan and have working groups, working groups that uh, make the delivery. Thank you so much. I'll use all my time. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that I omitted is our timekeepers in the back, and they're holding up the uh, time cards so that our candidates know how much time they have. And I need y'all to keep me honest. 
I bifurcated the agenda. We were supposed to start with an opening statement. So y'all gotta hold me, you know, hold me to the fire now if I'm not doing this the right way. So we're gonna um, thank you gentlemen for the statement about partnership and award. We actually now wanna allow you one minute to provide an opening statement and we'll start with Mr. Brown. One minute? Yes, one minute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, 200,000 people have left the city of Chicago and it has been heartbreaking for me because a lot of these issues that have caused people to want to leave, I've been an activist, frontline activist trying to make sure that the marginalized have had a voice. And even myself, I've had some very high highs and some very low lows trying to fight for a better Chicago my entire life. I've given it to public service. And I was born and raised in a household that was full of faith. And when I look in our community now, I just see so many people with so much untapped potential um, that I realized that in all my life, from now being hired to be a college professor with some college, um, having had three organizations and two of them are national, and being able to be a consultant to every level of government, I recognize that the only reason why I became what I am today is because of the people who were behind me. And with that being said, I'm done, my time is up. <laughs> Can we get a minute and 30 seconds? My name is Charles Town. So when you look at the seven four, it's four different communities, four distinct different communities. And the reason I'm running is because over the past 10 to 12 years, when we look at our ottoman, each ottoman has had their their set base. So we had an ottoman for South Shore, and now we have an ottoman for Jeffrey Manor. And um, I'm running to be the ottoman for the seven four. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We're going to move on to the public policy issue of economic development. All of us here know that South Shore is a commodity-rich neighborhood from our lakefront to our rich housing stock to our public transit and to our residents. We also recognize that there's been a great number of disinvestments that are taking place as we look at some of our business corridors and how economically depressed they are. But we hear larger conversations around striking developments, such as the Tiger Woods Golf Course and the Presidential Library Center. Can you talk to us about your vision to make sure that those large developments are representative of the South Shore community, while at the same time, how will you address making sure that there's economic vitalization for 71st, 75th, and 79th Street? And so I just want to say that on the record, um, when I work with ASE, I was a part of the Community Benefits Agreement. So the first Community Benefits Agreement that, that, I, that ASE had, I helped write that because I believe in Community Benefits Agreements. And so when we're talking about a Tiger Woods golf course or necessarily how, how is it going to impact the community and how are we going to benefit from it, we need the same thing. You know, so if, if we can't stop it from coming, we need to make sure that we have safeguards in place to protect the community, to protect the residents that already live here. We need to make sure that we have people who live in 60649 working at this golf course. We need to make sure we have young people, young people who go to High Park High School, young people who go to South Shore High School, being able to benefit from this golf course being here. In terms of our, our business corridors, the light business corridors, we just had a business open up on 71st, um, South Shore Group. And what they said was it took them two years after getting the neighborhood opportunity for a grant to open. We need to peel back the red tape on, on businesses being able to open in the ward. We need more resources for communities, for, um, for, so business owners like them, to be able to come in and say, hey, this is what I want to do. Work with the Ottoman, work with the South Shore Chamber, work with the Southeast Chamber, work with organizations within the ward so that they're able to get the resources they need, help build capacity, and make sure they're benefit the community. Thank you. Um, I am a strong believer in community benefits agreement, as well as when we were fighting to get the uh, trauma center on the south side of Chicago. Again, it all goes around organizing, and I've been saying this consistently. If downtown has a cold, our neighborhood has pneumonia. The issue is, is that when we want to control who comes and develop in our neighborhood, and we don't own the spaces that they're trying to negotiate in, we typically become bullied or when we don't have elected representatives 
who properly organize and inform us of what is actually at stake, that people are kind of sort of uh, not aware of what's happening to organize to make sure that there are community benefits agreements. And so I do plan as an alderman to make sure that anybody that wants to develop in the seventh ward, that they must introduce themselves to the community. And there's going to be a precinct captain system of 46 individuals who are going to be independently uh, uh, selected by the, by the community, that every developer that wants to come into our community will understand that we're looking for you to hire within the ward. We're looking for the people that's in the ward to actually own the spaces that you want to occupy and build in. And we want you to also make sure that you are, uh, as, we, as we're developing one of the most skilled labor forces in the city, we want to make sure that since we are a little bit behind the eight ball, that any, any opportunity that's coming to our area, that we're organizing the community to be, to be visible, to be present, and to be active as we press to make sure that every single entity gives a community benefits agreement and we vote in City Hall against developments on the north side or the north side of downtown that doesn't also extend to equity being on the south side of Chicago as well. Thank you very much. Moving on to education, which we know is the path forward to the future. Can you state your position on an elected school board and your position on charter schools for the seventh ward? Um, I fully support an elected school board. I don't think there's any other way for us to address it. We need to also make sure that our public schools are fully funded. And I do think that Chicago should put a moratorium on new charter schools. Um, one of the issues for our schools in our, in, our, in our neighborhood is that we have quite a bit of those that are level, labeled as level one. However, parent participation is low, and all of them are deemed, or pretty much 80% of them are deemed unsafe. And there are people who go from the southeast side of Chicago and they take their children all the way out west to go to school because they don't feel safe in the neighborhood school that's right down the street. And so my focus is to fight to get an elected school board, to make our neighborhoods uh, uh, safer. And one thing that all of them get to do that we don't often hear is as elected officials, you get to lobby all the way up to the federal government to find funding resources to make sure that our schools are adequately funded and as at every enrichment program and trade and things that we've lost in our school, I want residents to help create those programs so that we can actually teach our next generation of leaders uh, uh, with what CPS have lost the resources to create like the trade and, and, and after school programs, etc. Community schools are the epics and other community. You've never saw a really great school in a really bad community. When we talk about how, what people do, they move to areas to go to schools. They move to Lincoln Park. They move to Homewood Flossmore. They move to these areas so that the children have a, a good education. So when we're talking about education, it's, it's pivotal, particularly in the neighborhood school. Uh, in terms of the elected school board, in my trivial question, I said that I'm on the record in full support of an elected school board. I also want to state the fact that for well, everyone that says they're in support of an elected school board, what we have to safeguard against is the charters and the unions putting their candidates in and funding a race. In uh, Los Angeles County, $15 million was spent uh, in the school board race. And so when you have that much money in a school board race, it's no longer really a, a, a democratic process. But, so we want to make sure we, we have campaign finance reform behind the elected school board, but I do support the elected school board. And I also want to just talk about the fully funding of the, the neighborhood schools. I went to James Madison in Beast. When I went to James Madison, when I went to James Madison, we had multiple programs that were free for children to attend. And that's what helped keep me off the street. That's what helped keep me safe in my community. So we need to bring back those programs. We need to fully fund the schools and we need to make sure kids have access to those programs. Thank you. Thank you. We all recognize that um, the alderman is, in essence, the mayor of the ward. And that work should not just start when they are looking to be on the ballot. So can you talk to us about any initiative or strategy that you have around public safety and how to ensure that the South Shore community has the resources and the partnerships it needs to deal with the public safety concerns. We'll start with Charles. So I met some of the people in this very room at my beat meet. So the first time I met them was at a community policing meet at a beat meet. Um, when we talk about just public safety, 
I don't believe we need more officers on the street. I, need, I believe we need officers walking the beat, we need them on patrol, on the bike patrol, and we need them actually engaging with the community. When we talk about how do you, how do you improve the, the overall climate of, of a community, you know, we have people who get PTSD when they see the police. You know, when they see a police car, they're, they're triggered with PTSD. But if the police is engaging with the community, if we have more funding for community police and more funding for the CAPS program, more funding for the events that they do in the third and the fourth district, I believe we'll see the climate change in our community around policing. And we'll see people opening up and warming up to the police, and we'll see more people open to talking to the police, which in turn will deter and decrease crime. Uh, public safety is a, is a passion of mine. I currently am an advisor to the superintendent of Chicago Police and Eddie Johnson, as well as I help them with the rewriting of the level of force policy for the city. Um, and I've been on the front lines in our community alone. We've had uh, 323 shootings, 1,207 robberies, 2,149 burglaries uh, over the last three years since this administration. And what it speaks to is a quality of life issue and public safety is actually very pivotal in getting the essential things we need in our community because people always express not feeling safe coming over to our side of town. And so with that, uh, policing in Chicago is being, has been done completely wrong and the communities have to have a very real conversation. Yes, there's PTSD, but I'm gonna say something that might, might be shocking because you don't hear it said enough or often but some of our police officers are also engaged in some criminal activity, especially in our community, and they're very harassing and disrespectful to the constituents in the neighborhood. And so with that being said, uh, my, my commitment or what I'm looking to do around public safety is to make it that we bring back funding for the community watch programs and that we actually, when we do have 800 police officers short in Chicago, we are short 300 uh, detectives. That's why a lot of these crimes are not solved. We sit in uh, the, the, uh, the rates of solving crimes in Chicago, the clearance rate is uh, somewhere around 20 to 30%. And the only way that we're gonna be able to resolve that is that we have to be able to actually, uh, with the budget issue, 800 police officers short, I would like to uh, create a, uh, a way, uh, I've created a source by which we can actually employ residents to patrol some of their own communities, as well as we need to be finding more money to get the 300 detectives uh, the funding because this was what detectives do versus patrolmen. They're able to actually go into the community, develop the relationships, find out what the issues are, and. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. I know I have a lot of thoughts to get out. We're going to make sure that we try to provide you as much of an opportunity to speak to your complete thoughts. As I look around the room, I can tell that this is a very engaged community, so I'm sure you have all phoned your automatic office at some point in time or called 311. And sometimes the response you've gotten has been favorable, sometimes maybe not so much. So gentlemen, can you talk to us about how you would plan to set your office up, your service um, ward office, to make sure that it's fielding calls from residents and how you will use the 311 and other devices to make sure that constituency concerns are addressed appropriately. So I'm big on technology, and I believe that, so when you call the board office and you put in a service request number, on my official automatic page, I'm gonna have a ticker that's gonna show your service request number, and it's gonna show when your service request has been completed. And then someone from my office is gonna call you to make sure and ensure that the service request that you put in with the office has been completed. I think that that's one of the, the, the gaps that we have right now. When people call, but they don't get a service request number when they call 311, it's very important that you get the service request number so that you can hold myself or the current audit accountable. And then after that, making sure that it's completed. And so what I would do is just make sure we have a, a live ticker on my automatic page that shows when your service request has been completed and someone from my office is gonna call to make sure that, that you're satisfied. Uh, we, we, would, would, we are looking for, well first of all, the power of an alderman has really drastically shifted in Chicago. They don't really, deal, a lot of the services and things are ran digitally through downtown now. 
Uh, we need for all the men that are going to organize again the community to hold these institutions and these places accountable. So three problem thing. I believe that we need to have a physical office in the middle of the war, and we need to have more coordinated um, coordinated investment into our business district by creating a satellite office in different parts, depending on what project we're focusing on. And then I've committed to a 72-hour visit from my office personally, if you made a call for service and or a call to the office by either myself or the staff. And uh, on top of having the, 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 the uh, on, top, on top of having you all be able to follow up with the service request, I would like to also make sure that you all know that I won't stop campaigning. We, you see us coming and knocking on doors and visiting people. I plan on being a proactive alderman that's very much so in the community, visiting the residents and sometimes before there's a call, uh, I'm gonna just be coming around with our staff and making sure that the needs of our community is met. Remember what these gentlemen are saying, write them down so we can hold them accountable. Um, our leadership has to be held accountable and that is incumbent upon us. Well, before we shift into our last um, hour, I wanna make sure you all are jotting down your questions because we're gonna be opening up very soon and we wanna make sure that we can again, include as many of those questions as possible. We also wanna allow the candidates to pose a question to one another, so I want you to be giving some thought to that because we're gonna do that very shortly as well. One of the things that Pastor Anque said at the onset of the program was the number of aldermen that we've had um, just in his um, pastoral leadership tenure. And I think we all know that continuity of leadership is very important and it sets communities back when our aldermen are not able to hit the ground running. So knowing that you've spent a lot of time in the community um, as workers and as community organizers and activists, what would be the first piece of legislation that you would introduce as the alderman of the seventh ward? Mr. Brown. So, the first thing that I would like to do is draft a memorandum of understanding with the city of Chicago against gentrification, a bad gentrification and displacement policy. I do understand that we're living on a very valuable uh, parcel of Chicago's land. There is a intentional design to move us out of our community now that benefits are starting to finally come to the south side of Chicago so that they can bring in the generation of techies and talent from across the country. Uh, they've kind of written us off, if you will. And so my first focus would be to draft a understanding with the city of Chicago that any policy that's going to uh, have a negative impact from gentrification or displace the current residents here, that we actually, as a community, are going to work are working against it, as well as I believe that we should be looking to make sure that if a police officer is not servicing the community the proper way. Right now, currently, only a, uh, uh, you're very limited on how they can move officers from a community, but I believe that if an officer is not servicing the community, the legislation needs to be put in place that allows a delegation of selected community representatives to move that police officer out of the district to serve a community that they may feel more pro, uh, 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 better served. The first ordinance I would draft would be uh, ordinance to increase the uh, funds for the neighborhood opportunity fund. So what I would do is I would draft the ordinance to make sure 20% of TIP funds are allocated to the neighborhood opportunity fund. So by doing that, we have more money for more businesses to open up in our corridors. When you, go, when you look at our second fifth corridor, it's blighted from Yates to the lake. When you look at our exchange corridor, 71st to 79th, it's completely blighted. So I would make sure we take the TIP money and using that money for what it's actually meant to do, which is building our business corridors, and I would do it by allocating that money for the neighborhood Thank you. Um, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Moving to housing. What protections, reforms, legislation, ordinances, and other initiatives can be leveraged to increase the opportunities for affordable housing development in our community? Mr. Cohen. So I've been saying this in every I check, I check. So I've been saying this in every form. We don't have a an affordable housing problem in the war. We have people who are swimming under their mortgages because they can't afford them after the, the mortgage funds. 
what we need to do is make sure people are maintaining the value in the homes that they have. Um, a bungalow in South Shore is worth $250,000 at the high end. On the northwest side, it's worth a half a million dollars. We need that same equity in our homes. And so when we talk about affordable housing, we can't just talk about affordable housing in terms of condos and, and, and new development. We have to talk about how are the people who are here able to stay here. Um, and so what I would do is, I, I am on the, first of all, I will say this, I'm, I'm on the record in support of rent caps. Um, that's that's a, a starting but that's not the issue that we have. The issue that we have is home equity. Making sure people aren't, making sure people aren't swimming in debt because of the mortgages that they have. Making sure that people are able to afford the homes. Making sure people who live here are comfortable. Um, and that's my answer. It is a uh, very much so a similar answer, but um, I, I, we call it uh, low income housing, um, as well as you know we we already understand. I, again, I'm looking at the root of this. A lot of the times, it's even a study's been released that have proven that they have intentionally undervalued our homes. They they assessed them to be uh, uh, less valuable than they are, and so again, um, outside of what Cop Charles has already said. It goes back to being able to um, organize our neighborhood and our community in a way that is going against some of the, the planned policies of gentrifying and redlining us out of our community. And so the thing that we're looking to do is rent control, as well as to create a new generation of homeowners by identifying uh, trainings and grants from the federal and state government to help people become homeowners, especially those that are first-time buyers, so that we can have a less transient community and a more stable one on top of what Mr. Cowles already said. Thank you. So how many of us have ever called the Alderman's office about new lights on our block, or we want to speed hump, or we need our street repaid? Just me? All right. So you do realize that that money comes out of a capital improvement budget called the menu that each alderman um, has jurisdiction over. Given the volume of requests that come into uh, the automatic office, as our alderman, how would you create a just and transparent system for the allocation of the menu budget? Participatory budgeting, and it's basically a process by which you allow the constituents to, uh, what, what, how it's done in our particular ward, it will be done through that 43, 46 precinct captain system, where they will be able to vote on coordinated projects that uh, need to be taken care of in the ward. Um, as well as our current, the current administration has said that they've gotten a hundred million dollars more than the 5.2 that you're allocated in the four years that you're an alderman. Um, I think that our problems are solved, and maybe you should run for president at this point, but um, we need people who are genuinely able to identify resources on the state and federal government level so that we can increase that budget because it's not enough to meet the needs of the community. However, again, in bringing the community together in participatory budgeting, with an independent precinct captain system, they'll be able to plan and to vote on and to coordinate how certain, uh, uh, the infrastructure improvements come out in the community. So uh, I would use the same thing, participatory budgeting, but what I would do is different community organizations, different block clubs would, would basically submit a letter of inquiry. And so from those letter of inquiries, we would take the top four and then we would vote on them as a community. So we would vote them through robocalls, text messages, town halls. And so at the end of the day, a community, when we go to a community meeting, they can say, well, this is what this community chose to do. Um, so participatory budgeting, making sure um, people are putting in a letter of inquiry from different community organizations of different black clubs, and giving us a ward in totality, we vote on it through robocalls, text messages, and town halls. Thank you. So our first hour is history, and we want to prepare to transition into our next and last phase. I know that we've all been cooped up in the house the last couple of days, so I want you all to have an opportunity to get out and enjoy this sunny heat wave that we have on this Saturday. 
Um, but I want to do uh, one thing. I want to give you gentlemen an opportunity to formulate a question to present to one another. But I also want to give us an active exercise. How many of us have a Facebook or a social media page? Don't be shy because the majority of you all are my friends on Facebook. <laughs> all right. yes. So you know how we do Facebook Live? We're always posting, you know, where we went to eat, what we did last night. It's engagement such as this that really help amplify the importance of voting, the importance of the South Shore community, because again, we all know the value and the assets that we have. The media doesn't always portray that, but we know all too well. And so I want you to join me in this exercise and pull your phones out, and I want you to use the hashtag South Shore Votes. Let people know where you are right now, that you are taking time out of your day to become educated on candidates that are seeking your support, that you want to make sure that you're making an informed decision, and there's really an obligation that each one of us has. Ann talked about, you know, the importance of us register, register vote. But we've got to make sure that we're taking everybody in our household who is eligible to vote with us. The process now, they're trying to make it easier where you can actually register at the actual uh, polling place and vote then. So they're removing those obstacles. So it's important that we take responsibility for who our next mayor is going to be, who our next state treasurer and clerk, as well as our alderman. It's very important that we work together. Right now we're reading time and time again about the corruption that's taking place on the fifth floor in the city hall. So we really want to make sure that we're electing leaders with integrity that's going to be accountable to us. But we got to make noise. We got to let them know that we are here, that we are organized, and that we're going to hold their feet to the fire. So again, I'm going to be checking Facebook to make sure that the hashtag is being used and that you're promoting being here. You're promoting voting, letting people know that early voting has started, the importance of voting, where to go vote for seventh warders, where again, where's our early voting site? Jeffrey Manor. Jeffrey Manor. You know that on election day, you will have to vote in your home precinct. So you need to make sure you're aware of that. If you have moved, if you've changed your name, all of those information, all that information needs to be updated. And again, with technology, it's made much easier, but it's so important and so imperative that we exercise our right to vote. So I hope that gave you guys enough time to come up with a question, right? All right. Okay, we're going to start with Charles. You have a question for Jedediah. My opponent has, has done a lot of things in the city. Uh, I can't take it away from him. He's been on the front line for everything. Um, Trump, Plum, Donald, justice in general. Um, so are you going to be an alderman for the Seventh Ward or alderman for Chicago? Um, I think that just like any other person's occupation is often talked about as a skill set and not if they're going to be uh, available. Everything that I've ever um, gotten involved in in my life, I've been focused and I've been consistent and I've been effective. Um, what I'm excited to do is that all over the years that I have been able to be an activist, my work here in Chicago has spread it across the nation and every single resource that I've obtained from celebrities to civics to business owners uh, to regular people, I'm actually looking forward to focusing it in the seventh war and making sure that we can get, I believe that we're gonna solve 60% of the issues within four years because that's more than enough time for a quality of life shift and I'm gonna use every single thing that I've accumulated over those years to just simply deliver without excuses for what I'll be very focused on our community. As well as I say this, I believe that the seven Ward has to look at itself as a neighbor in a larger city because we keep on talking about war boundaries, but we are part and neighbors of an entire city. And with that being said, some of the people that's in the seven Ward, they won't even be in the seven Ward after the remapping. I'm going to be an alderman that fights for Chicago to do right by all of his people from the seven Ward. And when we go down to city council, just like I've done in all the projects, we're going to go down there 50,000, 53,000 people strong versus one. My question to you, Charles, is what have you, and you've been uh, also a very, very consistent uh, young man, and there's not too many people out here 
uh, in our age group that's actually trying to get involved and make a difference. And I applaud you for that. So my question to you is, what is a project that you have led and organized and consistent that have been a delivery, uh, a life quality change to our city? I don't have anything that I've done for the city. Um, but when we talk about South Shore, when we talk about the war, I've done a lot of things. So I was uh, one of the lead writers for the Southeast Observer, which was a newspaper here in the community. Um, I was on the committee that, that was for the South Shore 5K. Last year I actually ran our moderator's basketball program when she ran for Ottoman. And I've done the One Summer Chicago program and other multiple programs here in the war. So when we talk about what I'm gonna do for the city, I haven't done anything for the city. Not not large scale. But when we talk about the southeast side, I've done a lot. Thank you very much. Um, if you have not taken a ticket and entered it into the um, bowl for the drawing to ask a question, please do so, because we're gonna transition into that portion of the program. If you do have a question, um, we're gonna call numbers. Um, and again, we wanna try to field as many of the questions that you all have. But once again, please make sure they are questions um, and not just general statements. Yes, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Absolutely. So what we will do, and that will be a part of the, the closing um, portion of it, because we certainly want to, again, allow you all an opportunity to speak in totality as much as possible about your platforms. So without further ado, we're going to transition into the questions from the audience. Thank you, Cameron. So before we do the questions from the audience, I just have a question myself, which is regarding economic development. So as we know, community revitalization is critical to any community, right? Especially in terms of stabilizing a community. And the city of Chicago has a program that allows homeowners, which is the Dollar Lot program, and I know there are some residents who are here that were recently denied um, their application for uh, purchasing one of those lots. And so my question to you is, what checks and balances would you put in place, especially in terms of transparency, when it comes to those types of programs that will generate revenue into South Shore? And what I mean by checks and balances is, a lot of people who apply for those dollar lots were denied by the and they, those denials were in particular areas that are close to the lake, which means what? That development is coming, but those own, those homeowners that live close to the lake that applied for those lots were denied, and those lots were held by the aldermen. So when I talk about checks and balances, it's very critical to be aware of big businesses that can come and pull you in, right? So what checks and balances would you put in place to maintain transparency so that when programs like that can revitalize the community, the community members, the homeowners, have access because those community members and homeowners who could have purchased those lots would pay for taxes that pay for the schools in the community. So tell me, what checks and balances transparency would you all put in place? I just want to first say I'm glad Ebony's not in this race. <laughs> yes, I almost was. That's number one. And, and when we talk about the, the Dollar Lot program, and we talk about development, you know, if you look at the Third Ward, a lot of Third Ward lots are being held by the city and not sold solely because they know development was coming. So they knew development was coming. And, and so they had it. You know, Pat Dow, she wouldn't sell the lots. And then when they actually sold the lots, we had half a million dollar condos and townhouses built on those same lots, which is the plan for South Shore as well. What we have to do is make sure that the people who are here, who are putting the sweat equity into our community have the ability to buy those lots. And, and how do you make it more transparent? You make it more transparent by having a committee set up of community residents for residents who, who knows when someone puts in an application for a lot. So everyone knows that it's not a secret because it has to be 
can't be a secret. We're going before City Hall, but so that the entire board knows, hey, someone put in an application for another lot. They, they're home on here. They're messing here. We should sell them this lot. So it's a disingenuous shame, and basically it is basically the warehouse of people trying to look like they've done something or they will do something, but they're actually trying to hold on for political favors and clout. That's the way Chicago has worked, and that's the way it's trying to continue to work. And so I'll use this opportunity to say this. There is major opportunity in our city right now. That's why I said everything that's going to be done in the war, we need to own it, and we need to be organized enough to be the negotiators at the table. And so what I've done is I've looked at that program, and I realized that it is, it is just disingenuous but I am, but we also have some very fin big financial problems in our city. If we took all of the tips and took that money to try to fulfill our pension obligation, we would still be short $500 million. But there is an opportunity for us to stop being a city that taxes residents and actually start investing back in the community. So I'm presenting a South Side stimulus package where we can use a portion of the funds for tips as well as understanding that marijuana is about to be legalized. If they, if they put those licenses in the same areas and allow the young people to grow in areas where they predominantly had the arrest, then we just created reparations for our community. And so with that, I'm looking to utilize the ability to bring in that wealth so that we don't even have to worry about talking about a dollar. We can actually afford to buy the land in our community and we can get away from the political schemes of the city of Chicago by making sure that these people that are in our community have the capital to own, occupy, and to redevelop because that's a lot of reason why they say that they're not going to give it to you because you don't have the capital to redevelop. They knew we didn't have access to capital when they claimed to give us the last four dollars. So shame. <laughs> Shame. All right, thank you, Jedediah and Kyle. Kyle, it's good to see you. So we're going to go ahead and <clears throat> pull some tickets. Please make sure that you have your ticket. Please make sure that you have your question. I will bring the mic to you. Um, we want to limit each question to a minute because we want to allow the candidates an opportunity to respond. And um, we'll go from there. So let me pull the first ticket. Eight seven two zero two one. All right. Here I go. Good morning, um, and welcome everyone. Welcome our candidates. Um, can you hear me now? Okay, great. So I just want to ask you a little information regarding medical services. I want you to speak to the situation where we have a borderless community and regarding the current medical services. Now when I say borderless, I say that because currently you have three hospitals that service primarily our community, 8th Ward, 10th Ward, and there is a variety, there's a variety of services that are provided, there's a variety of services that are not provided. So can you speak to what you know currently the services that are being provided, and then speak to what's missing and what you will do to help bridge that gap? Great question. I'll try to move it to the end of the We'll start with that one. So we have, that's what I'm like, no, I can't get it back. So Trinity, Trinity, so we have Trinity, Jackson Park, Sasha Hospital. All three provide three different services. Now, when we talk about what do we need, we don't have a trauma center, and, and particularly the fourth district, when we talk about the, the southeast portion of the the war, we, we have a lot of violence. Um, but we do have a trauma center at, at U Chicago. Just in terms of the services they provide, I'm not really sure the services they provide. But what I will say is, we need more state funding for our hospitals, particularly South Shore Hospital. I know that they were at the end. Um, are they funding and they're about to go through their, their emergency safety net. So when we talk about just hospital, hospital services, I do know that South Shore Hospital needs more funding, and that's the state level issue. Definitely a state level issue. I again work to advocate to get a Southside Trauma Center, which is at the university. As well, I was invited into conversations with Dr. Carol Adams about designing it. And so I'm very proud of that as an accomplishment that we have, because we now have a Southside Trauma Center. As far as the three hospitals here, I'm, I'm just a very frank and upfront guy. 
If my leg got cut off in an accident, I would basically walk to the university because I'm not, I don't feel secure with the hospitals that we currently have. And so the, 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 what I'm gonna say is, is that we, well, well, as far as services, to ask your question, I can't, I don't know that either. Uh, but I do know that there is a safety issue and it's been tested by us. Uh, we were just at, uh, uh, the hospital in yeah, South. We were just at the hospital in Central. South Shore. We were just at South Shore Hospital, and we were able to walk in, go upstairs, and roam around the halls, and we weren't even checked by security. So we've done safety assessments on the hospitals to know that they need to become safer, as well as they need better methods for fast tracking patients. Because sometimes you're going there and you're kind of be waiting at limbo when you go back there. There's some sanitary needs. So as an alderman. The only thing that I've been able to ascertain for that is that we need to advocate for better safety measures, we need to uh, advocate for more efficiency, and we need to advocate for more sanity on us. Uh, a sanitary means in the hospital, but outside of that, I really can't speak to it, I'm sorry. Last numbers, 33, 8720333. <laughs> you don't have a question. You don't have oh. a question. If you win, you'll no, get on If y'all win, you'll get on board with Ford? No, all right, man. man. What do you guys plan to do to engage young people in the process of uh, you know, the uh, STEM manufacturing is a big thing now? Using technology to engage and help people bring technology. Engaging the young people bring STEM and technology. Um, uh, well, I actually believe that. Well, first of all, I would like to say that most of the workers in my campaign have, have been identifying young people in the community to actually work the campaign. So I've been building relationships with them, as well as I've been doing gang intervention throughout the course of my advocacy as well. And so I know a lot of the guys that's around the neighborhood, and that's there is a need for trade development. There's a need for you know a lot of the guys don't even have IDs or even know how to read literacy. Needs. So I plan on through having a relationship and being, you know, people keep saying that all of it is a part-time job, but we got full-time problems. So I can't yeah. understand that. But I believe that we need to get out there and engage the young people. And what I would love to do is to create a year-round manufacturer training facility. There's a tent that you can put up that gives you the opportunity to train year-round young people to have the trades and, and uh, uh, skills as well as fight for our education to, to, to have the STEM and the, um, um, the trades and the civics and back here in our school. Um, but but, but that, that, that is going to come with a plan that I'm gonna just, it's gonna be on our website within 48 hours and how we try to plan on making the seventh ward the most skilled labor force in Chicago. Because with the blight we have here, no matter where they're hiring in Chicago, we want them to look in the seventh ward for opportunity and we want them to definitely check out the young people who live here now. That's right. So my degree is in biological sciences. So when we talk about just how do we get people involved in the STEM sciences, it's really just access and opportunity. So it's a program called Cali Matters My Backyard that solely deals with 60649 and 60617, so, so South East Side. But the issue is no one knows about it. No one knows about Cali Matters My Backyard. It's a great program that we have, which is solely for the South East Side. So, but it's not publicized, so we need to make sure we're publicizing our programs that we have, and we need to make sure we're increasing funding for those programs. On a, in, in regards to technology, my son's nine years old. He can fix an iPhone screen. That's you know, my I work at High Park High School. They shot a video, edited the video during lunch, and it went viral by the end of the day. So these kids don't have an issue with technology. It's us honing those skills, honing those skills, making sure we're giving them the resources they need to to go to school, to, to get the degree, to make sure that they have a job available for the skill set that they have. And that's how you bring them in. Oh, you you edit videos on your phone? Well, come on, let's show you how to really edit the video. You know, you, you fix the iPhone screen as well. Well, let's see if we can get you a job working at Sprint in a repair center. Um, we have to make sure that we're looking at the skill set that they have and giving them the access and the ability to be successful. And we do both by publicizing programs we have more and increasing the funding.
Last two numbers, one, seven. One, seven. Glad I wore my gloves today. <laughs> Um, kind of speaking back on what you were just saying about how do we get these programs out, because I believe that there are a lot of programs in this area and people just don't know about it. Like, I look at the, you have to scroll through the current alderman, you have to scroll through his email to kind of look through all the flyers that pertain to the neighborhood. So, what are, um, I'm sorry. Do to, what are you all planning to do to make sure that, um, there's more technology so that we actually know what's going on. Like, how are you going to advocate for um, improving our information and technology infrastructure? Because in the city, our city website is shameful. And I mean, obviously, as Alderman, you don't control that, but you can advocate for more technology um, and more access um, because you should be able to do more in this city. Um, without having to call uh, pre one one. So basically, a more technology uh, savvy infrastructure so that residents can access information. Okay, so the first thing I want to say is the city website is hard to navigate on purpose. <laughs> That's purpose. <laughs> Just so everyone knows. Um, and the second thing is just making sure, and, and this is actually a, a reverse on what you just said, so we want to make sure we're sending out email blasts, but I get like a thousand emails a day. So if we're, if we're sending out an email blast, we want to make sure it's short and descriptive. And, and not only that, we want to make sure that we're working with our community organizations to get the, the word out. Um, and door knocking, you know, door knocking, neighbor to neighbor initiatives, that's what's really important. Um, so making sure we're using the technology smart, but also making sure that our neighbor to neighbor initiatives, that our door knocking, that our community organizations are helping to spread the message of things that they want. Like I'll give you guys a perfect example. Who's ever heard of Christmas in the Wards? Exactly. Now, so Christmas in the <laughs> so look on you, plug digging. So Christmas in the Wards is a is a program where aldermen come in and, and they donate gifts to to different communities. I mean, different, different neighbors, different families in the ward, but no one knows about it because it's not publicized. Because it's not publicized. But what we're going to do is make sure that it's publicized, make sure that it's marketed, make sure that everyone knows that Christmas in the wards is coming up. Do the Aldermans know about it? That's true. Yeah, they know. Yeah, okay. And so it's, it's just, that's going to be the echo. And I'm just more of a straight shooter. Everything in Chicago is done, is designed for our elected officials to be gatekeepers that stop us from getting the opportunities that are, that, that, that if you're not going to do their political will. That's how it's all designed, and we know that. So, again, with community engagement, and she, you said technology. Um, I connect with my national organizations through technology. It's very important. Yes, it should be simplified. But in our community, I'm going to say that one of, the, one of the biggest heartbreaks that I've had since I've been canvassing our neighborhood is that it seems that there's animosity from the north end to the south end of the world, from the older to the younger people. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that we now have to incentivize community gatherings and create an interface through technology where people want to go to it to learn about who each other who each other is, and we need to bring in experts to train the elderly community that don't that are not necessarily savvy with technology how to utilize it. But for us, technology is not going to be our is not priority right now. We got to get the people in the seven ward to talk to each other and to organize together so that we can actually become the community we should be. Amen. <laughs> Last two numbers, three, one. <laughs> what I wanted to basically um, put in the atmosphere is that um, I know that we're supposed to be asking questions. Just give one little half of a second to say this. We really, really need to hear the echo and the heartbeat of the candidates that sit before us because I've heard some really, really nice things and I heard some really, really uh, important things that we should focus on because we need change. We need change and we really need to dig deep and we really need to really, 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 really analyze the things that's before us because 
the heartbeat. Let me give the question. When you're running for an office, it's supposed to be people driven, meaning you have to have that heart. Ask candidates that's sitting here before us today, can you say that you really do have the heart for the people? That you will consider your job is for the people and not for selfish gain? Great question. Great question. <laughs> okay, so I'm a member of Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. So it's leaders of all, servants of all, we shall transcend all. So what is it? What is it? So basically, what I'm saying is, I'm a servant leader. That's I've been a servant leader all my life. I've dedicated my life to service of people, and I continue to do so. Answer me. I've been fighting on the front lines of advocacy for 17 years, in Chicago specifically for 10. And I've had every reason to leave this city. But the premise of my campaign is fighting to give people a reason to stay. No paycheck, no staff. Why won't you answer no me? And I'm more criticized than I'm celebrated. A lot of people would rather be comfortable than confrontation into systems that are oppressing them. Label when I've taken notes of poverty and everything else, I march no matter what the condition of the weather is. And I ran for all of them before. I lost. I didn't stop fighting for the city. But beyond that, I had a very public moment when I lost my child. Nobody can take it away from me that that was my child. That woman had asked a question. Excuse me, boss. You have a text message. There's been, been lies that have been put on me with my child. And I had a public moment where I wanted to take my own life in this very tough city. I never broke in 10 years fighting for Chicago. But when I lost my child, I finally broke. But when I broke, the city that I fought hard for ridiculed me and they abandoned me. And I got my healing. And guess what I did? I got right back up and I got right back to fight. And I got right on the national stage. And I'm a respected leader across this country for that. And I access every level of government now. And day one, I don't need, I'm not just dependent on City Hall. I've already found four businesses to come to our community. And they got one expectation. You got to give those licenses to people who live here from 7 Eleven to CD1 Price uh, to Open White Ice Cream. If the community wants it, you got to give those licenses for franchises to people who live here in the community. And, and all of this in my entire life has been for the people of the city of Chicago. Because I'll say this when you get done advocating for everybody else, you still got to figure out how to survive. So I spent most of my day fighting for everybody else, but then I still got to figure out how to pay my own bills. And that has not been an easy task. Mm -hmm. My heart is completely for the city of Chicago. Amen. Right, I want to um, segue just a bit into that, the question that was asked. Um, and this is regarding money. We all know if it, if it doesn't make money, what? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> Right? And that's usually how things happen, especially in politics. And one thing that I've seen from, from many politicians is that you can go into it with the heart for the people, but can you maintain the heart for the people? And I think for me, as a homeowner, as a landlord in South Shore, it, that's a very critical, critical question, and I'm glad she asked that. Do you have the heart? But I want to know, how are you going to maintain it? When, what are you going to do when it's time to bring money to South Shore and you can't, it won't pass appropriation. It won't come out of committee. You're denied by whoever um, is elected as mayor. That's very, very critical because a lot of people, as I mentioned, go into it with the heart for the people. But they can't maintain the heart and their side deals that are made, there are things that are said and done, and what happens is you lose yourself and you lose the heart of the people. So what are you gonna do? Because I don't wanna see that happen in South Shore. I don't wanna see my newly elected alderman sell out for South Shore. So I just wanna say I'm on the record, uh, no money from developers, just on the record, when we talk about who's donating to me. Also, 
I'm going to be honest. I'm going to have a moment of transparency. So everyone talks about how the current Alderman votes 100% with the mayor. It's not 100% with the mayor. It might be like 98%. But, but the purpose of voting with the mayor is to bring resources back to your community. That's, that's the thought process behind that. What has happened in the 7th Ward is we've had an Alderman who has voted with the mayor but hasn't brought the resources back to our community. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the real issue. He hasn't leveraged his vote. So what I would do is, if I'm at city council, I'm gonna make sure I'm leveraging my vote. We only need 26 votes to get something through. It's 17 black wards. We only need 26 votes to get something through in the 17 black wards. So I'm gonna work with my colleagues, both black, white, and Latino, to make sure I'm voting smart, to make sure that I'm getting my bills on the committee, to make sure when I get something on the, the city council floor, that I'm getting the votes that I need to bring back resources for the ward. Thank you. Again, um, first of all, because of the population decline, the, the, the particular wards are about 50 to 55,000 residents. We've lost 200,000 people in our community, predominantly black. In other words, coming next week, mapping, we're gonna have, we might have less black wards in Chicago and less representation. The problem with our politicians across the board, as I've had to deal with every single one of them, is that they're too afraid to stand up for their communities and their constituents. The reason there, there are three types of power that Chicago responds to. You're either going to have the money, you're going to have the name, or you're going to have the people. I plan on, um, and what you're saying is selling out is actually means independence. I'm only one vote in a larger scheme of things, and the only way that you can move Chicago is if Chicagoans are paying attention to what downtown is doing. And so I'm committed to making sure that you all are aware of what downtown is doing. And it doesn't matter if they want to close the school, if they want to if we want to deal with police brutality. It doesn't matter what sister agency is going on. I'm going to have two buses to make sure that out of 53,000 people, two bus loads of seven wards are at every single meeting that downtown has. And this is why. Because when you are able to make Chicago aware of what downtown is doing, you don't have to be become holding to a mayor, but the citizens are going to say that this is not what we want or this is what we want, and you have to have the ability to organize, educate, challenge, and resource the people to fight for what they deserve and what they want in the community. All the knowledge in the world is ineffective <coughs> if you cannot get people to come together and actually work to get the goal done. You keep your independence by once again. If I'm the alderman, I'm going to city council with 53,000 voices, not just one. They go to city council, they get their orders. We're going to city council to give them our agenda. Woo! Thank you, thank you, candidates. Uh, there is a vehicle with a license plate, Ask Lee, that is blocking another vehicle. Ask Lee is blocking another, okay, thank you. All right, this is getting good, y'all. Are you all enjoying yourself? Yeah. All right, I hope you got these questions ready because we, we need to ask the questions. Last two numbers, three, two, three, two, thirty-two. Last two number, two, nine, two, nine. Oh, I'll, you know what, when you come back, when you come back, I'll, um, after they ask this one, go ahead, you can move your car. Oh, he wants you to, okay. Oh, they don't want you to move now? <laughs> Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm so happy to be here and, and to listen to these two young men uh, give their heart as to what they're going to hopefully do for our community. But the, the biggest thing that I think of right now, because many points have already been addressed, how are you going to approach the fact that we have no grocery store? Thank you for that question. People have been waiting on it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I was on a grocery store campaign with Valkyrie and the Planning Coalition, just a full disclosure. But what we learned during that process was that when, when stores look at a community, they, they look at that. So they look at the viability and, and the feasibility of, you know. I hate that mic. I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you just like try to speak up a little loud? Yeah. Just, yeah. just like bottom of it. Don't hold the top of it. Hold the bottom. Okay. So the, 
they look, they do a visibility, uh, <laughs> a viability study and a feasibility study. Yes. And so when they do those studies, they decide whether or not they're going to open up a store in that community. Now, when we talk about these tips dollars and, and, and these subsidies, these are the businesses that need those tip dollars. These are the businesses that need those subsidies. Boeing doesn't need a subsidy. Aon Corporation doesn't need a subsidy. You know, Amazon didn't need a subsidy. We need to make sure we're giving tax subsidies and, and businesses to, to, to make grocers come to our community. Um, and also, I just want to say that the grocery store is an important board. Thank you. So we have a... Um, The, the, the actual grocery stores it, it sits in the fifth ward. It doesn't sit in the seventh ward. So we have, so we have the, dominance. Yeah, dominance. Because okay. yeah. I, I think that's where the the one was going with the question. The dominant site sits in the fifth ward, not the seventh ward. I'm approaching the grocery store just as everything else. I also work with the uh, commission to try to get grocery stores on the south and side of Chicago, um, but. There is this notion that we have to keep begging people to bring us what we already have in the community. Mm. And so my approach to the grocery store issue is, and, and, and I don't know how far down the line we are today, but we need quality food choice options now because people got to eat. And we need to make sure that those places look like us. Mm. There's a grocery store in this community or a little small convenience store in this community where they actually sell illegal guns and drugs to the to the young people and house their gang activity right on 75th. And so, and the operator does not look like us. My approach to this is to replace that with somebody from our community. And so I've, I've been identifying people while I've canvassed that want to actually be business owners so that we can actually fill all the vacancies in our business district with people here by giving them access to capital and making sure that they're trained to run a business effectively. The grocery store, we can work a cooperative grocery store model where the community can come together, raise our own funds and resources, advocate, and we can actually identify the vendors who bring us quality food to our neighborhood and the seven who can own its own grocery store. It may not be Mariano's, it may not be Dominic, but I would love to see something that says seven Ward residence grocery store, however we name it. My first task is to organize and cooperative so that we can build our own grocery store. Who knows? Maybe we can start putting chains around the country. <laughs> did that, did that, okay. I just wanted to make sure because they gave me some clarifying information, but she's good. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Last two numbers. Two zero. Two zero. Forty-two. Now I know I ain't seen that many people walk up out of here. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have a question. You don't have a question? Oh, well, I have. Look, okay. <laughs> uh, and I kept thinking it's somebody that came in a little later. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I, I wanted to pose this question because. For the room, for the people in the back. I'm so sorry. I apologize. I uh, want to pose this question to uh, candidates regarding um, these schools that have been closed in our communities. Um, do you have any thoughts in terms of repurposing those buildings? Um, our children need um, centers where they can come and um, acquire uh, after school tutorial programming, things like that. Um, some schools do, in fact, provide those after-school programs. But have we thought about repurposing some of these buildings that we have, some of these school buildings, per se, that are in our community? Um, and what's your thoughts about that? So all school buildings should be repurposed. When they're not repurposed and they're left shuttered and vacant, they actually bring down our property values, which, as I said, are, are already in the cellar. Um, when we talk about the repurposing, Price School, which is in the fourth ward on, I want to say like 41st and Drexel, it got repurposed as a church and a community center. And I believe we have organizations here in South Shore that can do the same thing. What they need is the resource, the, the access to capital. They need help from the autumn to make sure that their, their paperwork is okay. Thank you. 
So, so when they actually put in a bid for a property, everything is in line. I've, ident I've already de identified some funding sources that I'm going to hold the bottom. I'm sorry. I've already identified some funding sources that um, we're going to be uh, obtaining when I become the ultimate of the war, should I become the ultimate of the war, um, to make, I, I would like for the, uh, the, the schools to be repurposed because we're still paying utility bills for them, even though they're not being utilized. Um, but there is a, uh, a, an idea to create a town square. You know, that's like an old thing where the community would come and gather. And so we want to create a town square in the community and these vacant school buildings that will also house a place where we can actually give refuge to some of the homeless, have like an arcade for our young people, and have a lot of people have pop-up shop ideas. We can actually turn these buildings into epicenters of community building. Um, and so that is what I'm looking to do with the, the vacant school buildings in our ward. And the way I want to do it is those amazing organizations that are here, that are rooted in here, and by coming together, creating a collaborative, and giving them the access to the capital, and working with building and planning to give them the, the lot. Maybe they can get that for a dollar. And then we can turn that into an epicenter for our, those buildings into an epicenter for our community. And we've already identified the funding source. <laughs> so I just have um, one quick question. Since I, I'm gonna, I want to pull another number, but everybody's been quiet. Does somebody have a question? And I got so many numbers. Okay. Um, okay. So we'll do this. So I don't keep pulling numbers and nobody asks questions. I want to make sure we want to make sure that your questions get um, answered, but I have a, a just a, a question regarding <clears throat> the grocery store conversation or store conversation that we had. Uh, Charles had mentioned about the feasibility study and um, when businesses come, they want to make sure that there's viability. And <clears throat> South Shore has a very high rate of um, Section 8, the highest, I would say, in the city. Right? So when we talk about feasibility, viability, and stores coming to say, am I going to make money? <clears throat> South Shore has a very high transient rate of people coming in and out, in and out, because of those different elements that we have here in South Shore. So when you think about <clears throat> ordinances and businesses coming in, what other things are you going to do to make sure that we are viable and feasible so that we are attractive in terms of branding. Um, there's a lot of stigmatization attached to South Shore where businesses will say, I'm not coming here because I'm not gonna make money here because they're killing people here. So what are you going to do to change that to make sure that we are um, or appear viable so that businesses can thrive because it's very easy to say, yes, the community can pull together, but when you look at the community as a whole, in terms of dollars, are we viable? And then if you all could line up here, um, if, we can, if you feel like it, if you don't feel like standing, I'll come, I'm sorry, Jenna. If you don't feel like standing, I can come to you, but I just wanna make sure that we get your questions answered. Thank you so much, go ahead. Oh. Ooh, that's a loaded question. I believe that there has to be a wealth transfer and a quality of life change for our people. And that's what I'm focused on, making sure that we're able to deliver. And, whew, okay, that's what I'm looking for, looking to us to be able to deliver. Transient does not always equate to irresponsible. Um, there was a point when I needed government assistance to to thrive. I, I, um, so with the transient community, again, within the South Side Stimulus Package, we're hoping to identify even more resources to create business, I mean, homeowners as well as to create entrepreneurs. 
I am very, very, very convinced that those are excuses because businesses only care about profit. There is an active plan of gentrification. And so, in order for us to get businesses to come in, we have to have our community organized, and we have to have an identity that goes beyond what part of the community you live in. I'm the Jeffrey Manor people. I'm the South Shore people. When we become the Seven War people, and we begin to fill up these vacant business spaces with people who are in the community that own them, people will run to the Seven War versus us having to fight to try to beg somebody to come to the seventh floor. And I have seen completely desolate areas develop whole structures, brick and mortar, when they have a mayor who sends them the resources so that they can build. And I'm going to be a loud, unapologetic voice to whoever the mayor is to make sure they recognize that there must be equity in every budget, in every ordinance. There's $100 million right now in city government that is unmarked called the Catalyst Fund that was identified by the treasurer. The reason why that money did not come to the neighborhood as they promised it to come is because they've written the ordinance to lock it in. It should be a sense of urgency from City Hall to get us that kind of funds, and they basically require them to show a private investment. Don't forget about So when we talk about feasibility and viability, I just want to first say that the transient population and the Section 8 problem, the ultra hall, is that they aren't the issue. You know, so, so while that might be the stigma, they aren't the issue. The, the real issue is that we haven't correlated feasibility with buying power. So just because the median income for 606.49 says one thing, it doesn't equate to our buying power. So what we have to do is when we're in these meetings with these grocers and these businesses, we have to say, hey, okay, well, I know our median income is $42,000, but when we talk about what we're spending in terms of economy and, and um, commerce, we might match Lakeview, or we might match Lincoln Park, because we do. Um, and so I think that has to be the conversation that we have with businesses. And also, it's not just about making us look viable, it's about making sure that our corridors are, are clean. Um, I'll never forget this, when we actually did the, the grocery store campaign, uh, they said, Bob Mariano came to Sandy Preston Jeffrey at like 11 o'clock at night. So you came at 11 o'clock at night, and he saw what you saw, what you see on 71st of Jeffrey at 11 o'clock at night, and that was a turnoff. And so how do we do that? How do we get business coming? Uh, making sure our, our business corridors are, are, are clever lawyering, making sure that um, the, the loose boy man and the weed man and, the, and the everybody, whatever they sell them in, you know, uh, is held accountable and, and that we're making sure we're doing our due diligence to keep our corridors clean. Thank you so much. All right, so each person here has one minute to ask a question. Each candidate has one minute to respond. We want to hurry up and get you out of here. All right, so I've heard uh, a lot of great things here in terms of participatory budgeting, uh, zoning advisory councils. Um, what I, and I want to bring it down from a 30,000 square foot to, or 30,000 foot view, to really think about the tactical co-governance. So um, what is sort of that 100-day plan to actually trans transition towards co-governance? That means devolving power from the aldermanic office back to both community organizations and residents. Um, so thinking about how you're forming those committees within that first 100 days. So within the first 100 days, what, what I'll do is identify um, nonpartisan organizations that are in the ward that have been working towards the quality of life plan for the ward and empowering them so that when we sit at the table, we sit at the table as equal. So I'm not just the alderman sitting with constituents, but I'm the alderman sitting with people who are equally as vested in the community as I am. And when you do that, when they go back to, to the people of their organization, they go back to their black club, they can say, hey, we sit at the table and we came to a decision together. I think that's one of the first steps we should make in terms of running a more transparent um, constituent-based office. Okay, one minute. Uh, we're going to have a uh, follow-up election and it's going to be in our community where anybody that is a resident that would like to step up to be a precinct captain, they will be able to do so and we will, within their precinct, get find, identify those 46 individuals. Also, the second, the second thing that I'm planning on doing is everybody who ran for alderman in the community, I would like to make sure that they're the office staff that we're going to be working with so that they have an opportunity to, 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 to work in the community. The benefit of that is we all have our own support bases. It's going to bring us closer together. And then when 
this elected 46th precinct captain system is put in place. That's going to be independent. That's going to be my accountability. I also will not run for commitment because there needs to be a check of power as well. And we need to uh, make sure that they are then rolling directly out the participatory budget program and how they're going to make sure they disseminate information within their precinct and they vote on the projects that need to be done. In other words, I'm completely committed to making sure that the residents run and govern the seven ward office. You vote in city council matters. So one of the big debates um, that I see online is conversation about the Hill Yards project, the Olympia Park, how that is going to be using tip funds, whether it's going to the city. If you were in city council today, my question is, would you vote yes or no to either approve or deny that project, and how does your vote impact South Shore? So. <clears throat> You know, they, they have um, automatic priority, say, well, uh, automatic privilege. So, I mean, whatever I want to do for my ward, I'm going to do for my ward, and the rest of the city council is supposed to vote to push it through. This goes back to what I said about leveraging my vote. So, if I need to get something out of committee, I'm going to talk to the second ward alderman and say, hey, what's up? <laughs> you know, like I'm trying to get something out of committee. If you want me to vote for, for this project for your ward, um, you have to help me, and even still, I still might not vote for it just because of the impact that Lincoln Yards is going to have on the city as a whole, particularly the Lincoln Park community and uh, the community sort of the South Ukrainian village. I don't want to sound redundant, but I also want to go on record to say that I've already experienced that. We fought to get the municipal distance areas ordinance out of committee, which required banks to tell the city of Chicago what they were doing with taxpayer funds that were sitting in their institutions. And I had to fight Ed Burke to do so. And in that, I learned that when you have aldermen that are beholden to a mayor, they are not going to negotiate with you to go against the will of the mayor. In order to do so, again, it's a very simple and redundant answer. You have to organize your community, and they have to speak about the disparities and the inequity that is in the system of Chicago so that the larger city, the residents, will begin to echo that how can we develop a billion-dollar project on the north side when we have historically continued to disinvest on the south side. We have been a great neighbor in Chicago from this side of Chicago making sure every other neighborhood has been developed. It is time that the city of Chicago make the south and the west side of the city a priority, and we need the champion to be loud and unapologetic about that. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, the most growing concern for um, parents is their children being abducted, kidnapped, uh, running away from home. So as a uh, seventh ward, all of it, what is your plan or agenda to protect at risk, at risk uh, young people and young women who are uh, being abducted, or how do you plan to prevent one year in office? So um, just around the children, pushing more money towards the, what is it called? I thought you said you walked in. Oh, no. The, the safe, safe, walk. safe zone. Um, yeah, so the, the safe zone. The, so when we talk about, I can't even think of it. Oh, my God. But so when we talk about, um, yes, yes, there we go. So um, increase the number of people we have in the safe passage program. And by doing that, not only do we um, improve safety, but we employ people from the community because most of the time when people are from the community, the people who do the safe passage, they're from the community, and so we're employing community members, and we're also making sure that our children are safe. I'm not sure if I want to increase the number of safe passage workers, but I definitely want to increase their pay because a lot of, even during the portal voting vortex, there was some safe passage workers who had no heat and they had no resources to even make sure they were safe or they make sure the rest of our children were safe. Mm -hmm. I've also been very active with the BHA campaign in going and finding missing children in the city of Chicago. And it goes to one simple fundamental value. We've got to get back to the days when everybody's children were our children and we have programs and activities that keep them active so they're not wandering around in the, in the city where predators are being unchecked because we don't have enough detectives to solve the crimes and find out who is out here abducting our children and creating the violence and the havoc. But on top of that, the community safety program where we're gonna fund residents to do safety patrols in our community to get to know the children in partnership with the 
Chicago Police Department will also enhance our ability to keep our children safe. And there needs to be legislation drafted, I will do it from my office, that will make sure that we tell when children are missing immediately and not the end of alert uh, wait period that we have. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie. Um, the current alderman said he brought $100 million to the board. Come on, Come on now. I need to know what it, you all feel about that. It's okay. Because I don't see it. <laughs> yeah, he said it's for infrastructure. So okay, so the $100 million that the, that the alderman said he brought to the board. It was brought to the board, but it wasn't brought to the board by his office. Right. It was it was capital infrastructure programs that Mayor Romney Manual already had in place. Right. And so those things are gonna happen regardless. The thing where I was gonna happen, um, he might have had some influence on it, but to say that he bought one hundred million dollars to the war is just not true. It's a mistake. He would be running for president of the United States of America. Because he only get 5.2 million, and if he raised a hundred million dollars, he needs to be the mayor. And it's really simple. They, the lead that was in the water pipes was contam is contaminating our home. The mayor contributed, I mean, committed to fixing the pipes. Uh, 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 I think it's somewhere to the tune of 93 million came to our community specifically, and he is taking credit for it, just like he's taking credit for Christmas in the war. Just like, it's, just like he's not here for the for the forum saying that he didn't get an invitation. He should have sent a representative to the Park Advisory Council. He should have been here speaking about his plan for the next four years. I am very, very disheartened about the misrepresentations of what has been accomplished in our ward. Because let's be honest, in four years, you'll be talking about more than lights and paved streets and garbage cans. Any alderman would do that. There has been nothing done to address the quality of life concerns in this community, including finding $100 million. According to the Tribune, he has brought in nearly almost, into his, to his credit, Hi. almost $1 million. And that $1 Hi. million, dollars, I can't finish there. <laughs> my time is Not to mention, talking about dogs. I don't know. Dogs. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is there is a disenfranchised group that makes up a big part of South Shore, and I'm talking about the renters. And so basically, for the past five, six years, there's been big development companies coming in and putting evictions on these renters. Their RTLOs, residential tenant landlord ordinances, have not been upheld, and most of those evictions are coming from those RTLOs not being upheld. These buildings that they live in are below par. And once you get eviction on your background, that's equivalent to having a felony. And so then it's hard for them to move. So I just place these people, and I place a lot of these people right here in South Shore. I don't see them represented here, but they make up a big part of South Shore. So what are you gonna do about that? Um, yeah. About those residential tenant landlord ordinances, about those big companies that come in here and put these evictions on these people's names and making them unrentable. Because the renters, that's, that makes up the bigger portion. That is a very complex question, but I'm gonna say this again. I and I and I can call that I have identified seven lawyers who live in the seventh ward, and I basically talked to them about creating a deal where it's going from housing to criminal matters that basically if we can create a coalition of lawyers who live in the community, uh, we want to make sure that we're providing lawyers for, for our community, from our community, and we're identifying funding sources to help pay for that. But this has become the place where you go to get an eviction. Mm -hmm. And I think in order for that, it's time for us to start holding these foreign landlords accountable, as well as to make sure that we put rent control in place. I do believe that that's necessary right now, because we got to raise the living wage for the people who live in our community. Uh, but uh, rent control, and I'm actually trying to identify every single owner of every property, uh, foreign or domestic, so that we can hold them accountable to how they're treating our constituents and rent. So the, the real issue is that when we talk about South Shore, when we talk about the marginalization of renters and, and um, Section 8 voucher holders or uh, subsidy holders, is, is homeowners versus renters. And, and, and the homeowners feel like the renters aren't as vested in the community. And, and that's a misnomer. We have to get away from that. We have to get to the space where everyone is represented and, and everyone knows that they're represented and they know that their, their opinions matter because at the end of the day, they live here too. They vote just like we do. They go to the same school as we do. 
You know, their, their children go to the Central Library just like our children do. So we need to make sure that not only are we including them in the, the government process, but that they feel welcome there and, and included. Right. So I, I just want to clarify her question um, because I, I, as I'm listening to the responses, I'm not getting the right answer. And then this is, I'm sorry, the last, I've been told I got to wrap it up. But I, I looked and I'm like, I don't, you're not answering the question right. The question is about ordinances. So when you look at, and this is the conversation that I had with the alderman, um, because I was concerned, what are you doing about the ordinances? You have a multitude of renters. If you go down South Shore Drive, huge multi-unit buildings with absentee landlords, right? They don't live here. And so the ordinances, what are you, how are you gonna change the ordinance? Because the, the way the ordinance is set up now, and Val told me I gotta hurry up. The way the ordinance is set now is that it allows companies like p and to evict. In 2017, the Chicago Reader had indicated that South Shore was considered the eviction capital wow. for organizations like p and And they were the ones that were evicting. We just have a gentleman on the news, Pangea, what, not turning up the heat, but he might get evicted. Anyway, ordinances, not what you all were answering. Thank you. Thank you. So we would have to just make sure we're following the ordinances to the letter of the law, make sure that tenants who live in these buildings know the, um, the tenant ordinances and, and making sure that my office is making sure we're doing everything that we need to do to, to make sure that they are informed and do know their rights. <laughs> But on top of that, I'm looking for people like yourself because there comes a time when every elected official have to be honest that they can't do it all themselves. I can't, we may, may not be able to master everything and I would like to talk to you about that to get a greater uh, understanding of your expectation. But for me, um, there, I'm open for drafting legislation, but more than anything, I'm open for giving people the quality of life shift that they need to become owners, to become the ones to own these buildings, and to have the capital to pay their rent, and still eat, and still be able to invest in things that they care about in their hobbies. I'm looking to improve the quality of life, but I'm also open to rewriting the ordinances and working to get it back. Okay, Val just told me that it's time. Um, please don't kill the messenger. I'm just following my orders. Um, so who do I, Val, Kiana, who am I turning it over to? You said it's wrapped. They have to get their, they have to get their yeah, I, I have to say this. Oh. Can you just let this, let them answer the Val, there's a question on the floor. Okay. Okay. This is regarding the school and uh, the LSC. And I know that, you know, we want to protect the children in the community. But again, back if you want to have better schools, you need to have uh, active LSD. Um, there needs to be a way for the school system to get parents, in this particular community, where we have the type of parents that we have, we need to have a different law that covers the background check. You know, we lost our whole LSC uh, because the background check. So, there's somebody needs to take a look at how the background check is done for the LSC. So, just to make sure I'm getting this question right, you're saying that we should have less stringent laws for, for the, the LSC or more stringent laws? Less for the parents, because the parents have the children in school and they're not taking their children away. But at the same time, when the background check is done, they can pass the background check to be on the LSC. So, to answer, I don't want less laws. I'm gonna just say that on the record right now. We don't, we don't need less stringent laws. We have to keep our children safe. But what we do need to do is make sure that we have an LSC with resources. So when I, if you actually go to my website, what I say is I want a full functioning LSC with money allocated to improve community and parent engagement with the LSC. So a lot of times we have an LSC election and you're gonna have seven people on the LSC and it's gonna be seven people who vote the seven people who ran. So we need to make sure that we have more money allocated for that process. And I would say that uh, my fight is to expand the powers of the LSC and to uh, highlight it more so that more parents will um, want to, or more parents will actually run for LSC. I'm also thinking of the same um, um, mindset that I, I think that we need more the laws are not, they don't, I don't think that we need to, the ceiling is fine, but we need to uh, attract a broader base and find other ways to make sure that those parents 
who cannot pass that background check are still involved and they have the voice that they need at the table. Well, thank you, gentlemen, so much. Thank you to our attendees for being here today. Thank you to Pastor Anquan and the church for opening their doors. We're going to afford each of you 30 seconds to give your closing statement. I'd encourage you to include your website address, any other means that um, voters can follow back up with you and stay apprised of your campaign. The last gentleman had a question about community policing. If you could just infuse your position um, on that into your closing statement, that would be great. Thank you so much. My website is Charles Cow for Alderman. My Facebook is my name, Charles Cow, both my Facebook political page and my regular Facebook. In terms of community policing, Charles Cow for Alderman, K Y L E. In terms of community policing, we need more funding for community policing. We, the community polices itself. When you look at Mount Greenwood, when you look at some of these other communities, when you look at Bridgeport, they police themselves. So they are the first line of defense versus crime. And, and we need the same thing. Auxiliary police officers, I served in eight years and I did it also in Trumbull Park. I believe that community and auxiliary police officers is the way to go for some of my safety concerns. Uh, my website, things are on the literature that's being passed out in the room. If you don't mind grabbing it, my website is getting ready to be refreshed, so you're going to see it go up differently in two days. Um, but this is my issue here. I believe that this is either our greatest stance or our last chance to make sure that we're seated at the table Hi. and not on the menu for what Chicago's direction is headed in. And I want to be an autumn that's champion fighting and deliver resources again without excuse. Thank you again, gentlemen, so much. Remember these voices that you heard from today. South Shore Votes, remember to hashtag that. Thank you to the Neighborhood Network Alliance and Dems on the Move who hosted today. There are two other forums that are also going to be taking place in the 5th and the 8th War because again, this is all South Shore. Stay warm, God bless, and register, register, vote.